Hi, gentlemen. Good to see you again. Hello. First things first, what, what have you been up to since we last spoke? <laughs> yeah, well, you, I don't know if you follow the news, but there's been a kind of global lockdown. <laughs> We've been uh, stuck in the house. We have got out recently to play some gigs and stuff, but it has been a furtive period of self-isolation. Uh, and good things have come out of that, hopefully. We've been making and that, music and, that, and keeping busy. And now our country's run out of petrol. Because <laughs> <laughs> of Brexit. Yeah, man. yeah, I was going to ask, how is Brexit working out for you guys? But... <laughs> <laughs> it caused uh, a few issues at the weekend when we were trying to get to a gig, but um, mm, yeah, yeah, constant dramas. You don't take, you, you know, you don't get too stressed out by these sort of things these days. What with it constantly <laughs> going on? As long as it doesn't start raining locusts and the rest of the signs start lining up, we should be all right. Yeah, you can you can't let it get to you. I think you have to you have to try and see the humor uh, in it. Yeah. I suppose. Oh, definitely, definitely do. But with with the year uh, that it's been, then is is it a very creative period? Then a very fertile uh, fertile period for for your own creativity. I mean, it yeah, has man. been. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it kind of being creative certainly got us through. Certainly got me through the last uh, year and a half of you know not much going on um in particular taking to the to the airwaves and streaming our dj sets um kept us both busy and kept us both buying records and keeping kept our heads in it really mm. uh, i don't if we didn't if we hadn't done that i don't think we would have practiced very much or bought many records you know it's just kept us in that world we also made some great contacts as well just like you know chatting to some of our favorite djs watching them and that mm. stuff um so yeah it has it has been creative although not as exciting perhaps you mentioned something interesting which is buying records now in this time when we're all uh, behind our computers most of the day i suppose um is there a big difference for you guys um going through a record shop and sifting through the albums and and going online or is it pretty much the same been heavily online places like juno in this country um, and definitely discogs before all the prices of postage and shipping went through the roof that's kind of one of the first ports of call i get in the morning you scrolling through and seeing what's on the wants list so doing the digital digging uh, putting the time in but maybe not getting as much of the dusty fingers as some of the more hardcore diggers who go out there but yeah definitely being obsessed with looking for the perfect beat has kept us going for the whole the whole of the whole of everything really this is going to be a very annoying question then, but what is the perfect beat? Uh, it's 125 BPM. Uh, it's in a 4-4 styling with a kind of syncopated cowbell. Still trying to find it! <laughs> no, but is, is there an ideal or something that you're, you're looking for when, when you're sifting through these uh, records? I don't think there's anything in specific. I think things just have a tendency to jump out at you with if it'll be a certain character or a mood or a way that they were recorded or an energy within that record that you uh, think, oh, that's, you know, that sounds like it could be us. We'll, we'll take that kind of thing. Yeah. Definitely. Well, you might hear something and then it passes you by in the blink of an eye and you have to stop, check the record out, put it on a loop, sit back and, and stare at that loop and see if that loop could entertain you for for hours on end because you're going to get very familiar with it <laughs> so slowing it down and finding spacing it and seeing what else you can add to it and it just yeah create this kind of weird little uh reverse say reverse tetris i don't know which way tetris goes building blocks is what i'm getting at <laughs> yeah adding that stuff together but that's, a, that's an interesting uh, point because uh, well firstly what is and you've always been quite eclectic in your approach to the music i suppose but do you have somewhat of an identity uh, do you think uh, I'd like to think so musically. I always um, I liken it to Mr. Scruff, and I say this because I used to go and watch him DJ a lot, and I always thought, man, that guy picks records that sound like him when he plays. There's a certain character to almost everything that he plays that sounds like him, and I can and he would find, you know everything he finds has got this sort of little almost like a little cheeky riff to in it or something that just sounds a bit Mr. Scruffy. Mm. So I think I've certainly thought about that and try, I think maybe we tried to emulate that in our own way with uh, the tracks we've made. They've all got to have the certain kind of characteristic perhaps, maybe with a few, uh, a 
few exceptions of like tracks like uh, Lean On You, the new one, mm. which is just uh, really tough. But yeah, I think most of our stuff has a little sound and we've certainly been told that before by fans and stuff. So yeah. Definitely getting into Becoming the Allergies was about honing the influences we had and maybe cutting off some of the other bits that we weren't really into that we might have been playing to win people over as DJs and just having integrity and vision of a path to stick to these types of tunes that we knew we wanted to emulate, mix, sound like and celebrate. So it's about it's been about stripping away some of the extremities of that and keeping a bit of a focus on things that you would want to stand next to and identify with. So definitely, yeah. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you have to be uh, into the songs if you if you are going to work on them and, and the time it takes and the, the amounts of time that you have to listen to it. Mm. So does it occur that you start working on a song and just in the middle of it get sick of it? <laughs> uh, yeah, but like I say, if you can listen to the same eight bar loop for a week without going criminally insane, then you know you're onto something. Mm. But sometimes putting it to one side because it's so intensive, you're looking at it, you, you know, you're that close to the canvas, it's hard to see the bigger picture sometimes. But if you step back from it, forget about it, and come back to it with a fresh set of ears, you might have forgot the intense process of making it and you just get to absorb it as a piece of music for the first time again. So yeah, a bit of both. Mm. And now with the new record, The, the Promised Land, what, were you looking for specific sounds? Because I suppose that... The, as you make albums and as you make music, you kind of develop that identity that we talked about as well. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we were looking for specific sounds. I mean, it's funny that the records ended up having a very positive message in the end. Um, and I don't know how intentional that was during the writing process, but tracks like Are You Ready, Lean On You, um, Promised Land itself, mm -hmm. Love Somebody, they're all kind of positive with a positive message um and the idea was with the album certainly with the artwork and the concept of it all was that you know we were emerging from something and, and looking to a better place a promised land where we mm -hmm. could uh, all live better lives and be better people man <laughs> <Through that. laughs> sounds Through a bit that. wanky doesn't it but um yeah. Yeah, it's, no, but uh, I, I do think it's important, especially in these times, to if, to not fall into the abyss uh, too deep. That you have to remind yourself of the things that that are enjoyable, and then uh, to look at yes. uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, so to say. Yeah, op optimism is always the right the right path, I think. But yeah, did you expect to make an album this quickly? Then this is just how quick we work, really. Okay. We could have another one out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just about learning the quality control, judging what is a good period of time to let an album breathe. But because it's our passion, obsession, income, life, we do it all the time. So you're just racking up demos and it's just how much work you're willing to put into those to flesh them out into songs, to become albums and then start the whole campaign. Because you have to hand it in quite a while before it all comes out because we like to make sure there's some consistency to the to the whole campaign from the artwork to how the singles progress to judge what's a good one to open with on the radio, some curveball to establish like a new sound for the album. So yeah. it, it is also like, we've got a very dance music approach to making music, you know, it's samples and stuff for the main part. So it is quicker to put that stuff together than perhaps it would be to, I don't know, get an eight piece band and learn all these songs and rehearse them together and then go into a studio and multi track yeah. them and, you know, all that stuff. So perhaps that's where a normal band would take longer or it would take them longer. And because we've got more of a dance music approach, I think it ends up being faster. That's right. Some of these might have been written in an afternoon and then just finessed, <laughs> you know. And some might have been laboured over and pulled apart and reassembled over the course of a year. Mm. But it just depends on the quality of the loop and how much you're willing to let that drive the song. If you go, that's as good as it is, as it needs to be, or whether you need to embellish it to put your own signature sound on it so it at least looks like you've contributed something more than just stealing eight bars. <laughs> well, when it comes to those samples, and, and this is a question I've always had, and maybe it's a stupid question and, and a bit boring, but... Is it just as easy as, as you can use whatever, or is there a whole uh, legal side to it that you have to clear everything? And, and uh, how does that work? 
because can you just pretty much use what you want or is there a whole structure to it? Uh, you can't use what you want these days. It depends, I think, what level you're at. And now that we're emerging as more successful artists and getting our music on adverts, we have to be a lot more careful and think about what we're doing. Um, for the most part, our, our me uh, the, the samples that we use are pre-cleared. Um, sometimes the label have to clear some. Um, so, yeah, no, there is definitely consideration that's gone into it, um, picking out hopefully just a couple of key hooks uh, from maybe two different records or something and then peppering it with other stuff that we've got in our libraries, uh, you know, certain hits, this, that and the other. And then, of course, laying over our own instruments with our session guys and vocalists and stuff as well. So, but yeah, normally there's one or two main hooks from a, from a record that we're clearing for sure. And was there, you mentioned kind of how a start, uh, an album like this starts to take shape. So was there a key song that kind of got the got the ball rolling? Yeah, it was Promised Land, that what became the title track, really. Just went away uh, for a camping weekend and reconnected with some friends and with some nature and had a few spiritual moments by a campfire and then came back and couldn't think about anything other than these songs and samples I'd been hearing in the past and trying to make sense of them and put them together and kind of, it just took a life its own on. And when it felt such a kind of spiritual record to make, that it felt like a great centerpiece for an album and, and everything started to hang off of that conceptually and vibe wise. So I think that was definitely one, but I think before that we'd met the, there was also Jumping Off, which came a little bit before that as well and Working On Me, which actually I think was a hangover from a previous project. Okay. But I think in terms of the heart of the album, it was Promised Land, I think. Well, let's take Promised Land then, because it is the title track. This concept of the Promised Land, you kind of alluded to it earlier, but this optimistic notion of a Promised Land, uh, what does that mean to you, or how do you perceive that concept? Um, well, it, it really was just a product of lockdown and just everything being so miserable and bleak and dark and, you know, negative, turning on the news, everything just being so, so sad. You know, it was, we all ex must have experienced it in one way or another, some more than others. Some of us lost people that we know. Um, so, yeah, it was just, uh, you know, we had to find a way to turn those really negative few years into something positive really and that was just that just seemed like the natural thing to do I guess yeah yeah definitely it was about finding some hope wasn't it and yeah. if you feel trapped trying to make an album that had a sense of freedom to it so that's why the cover has got this expanse that you can walk into like all good music should be a bit of a journey as you say and there's like an open ticket just to come on in and follow behind us on, on the album cover and, and have a little dig around and find somewhere cool and safe away from all the anxiety. But it's interesting that you say that because the uh, conception of the song then came together as you were kind of on a journey yourself, as you were kind of outside in the outdoors and then going yeah. through. So how important is kind of real life experience in the in the music that you make? Because I can imagine a lot of music is also... Uh, especially electronic music and stuff is, is made mm. sitting in the studio uh, yeah. a lot of the time. So how important is are the other moments? Well, going out and finding all these cool walkways and paths to go and jog and ramble on around my house that I never knew existed really fed into the album and just reconnecting with stuff outside of the grey paths and everything around you and you're finding little rivers and woodlands and that was super cool and you could take some of that back in when you sat down with your headphones on staring at a screen mm. and normally making the album it all starts in this right here where it's you know quite lonely nothing goes on except the postman turns up but during lockdown my girlfriend was uh, working from home as well so I actually had someone with me the whole time so I actually met I was with more people during lockdown than I would be normally just sat in the yeah. house a week so I the moment. <laughs> oh, that's good um, you, and you also mentioned, uh, I got to get it right, uh, Working On Me, I think you mentioned. Working On Me, uh, as a leftover from, from the previous album, I found that an interesting one because it, it kind of has vocals in it, but not really. And there's a, there's a very hypnotic quality, a rep not repetitive, that's not the right word. But um, uh, yeah, how does a song like that start 
to come together and how do you know well we shouldn't add vocals we shouldn't add uh, somebody mm -hmm. rapping over this or how do you make those decisions well it was a case with that one of having such a chunky guitar riff and just feeling this kind of funkier end of late 90s big beat type thing and going they just had records and ideas and wanted to make people dance so that was good enough so once you got the chunk of that together and a few extra samples you start beefing the drums up you at that stage you're like right we could get a rapper on or a vocalist and make it a song but we we're very much in the headspace of returning back to our roots with the first album making more cut and paste sample stuff so then you have to go digging for a sample in the same key that you could work with the vocal in and because the vocals on that record are from a different entirely different speed entirely different genre uh, and the original samples covered in drums and music had to extract it using eqing and pull out lyrics and words and then cut that up to make a riff so if you hear the original samples it you wouldn't know mm -hmm. where it come from, essentially. I remember yeah. thinking with that record that it was too repetitive. <laughs> and, and like the intro wasn't like right. And I know we tried lots of different arrangements with it, and but then just went back to the original one. And yeah, it does work, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. There, there is, a like I said, a certain hypnotic quality to it that, mm -hmm. that you kind of get into the groove. Um, mm -hmm. But what you mentioned about uh, samples, then again, what I find interesting, then are there certain eras? Because obviously you're inspired by funk, soul, and all, all those kind of things. But are there certain eras of music or certain years that that particularly uh, stick out for you guys? Or because one thing that I suppose you, people don't really sample music that is quite recent, right? Yeah, for sure. It's uh, you know the era is. The, you know, the golden era of funk and soul for us really um, through I guess late 60s into 70s is the main kind of pots um, but yeah I guess there's other things that might be lifted from an 80s record uh, you know a, a drum roll or something just to give it a different flavor it depends which track we're working on really and what we think it needs I guess mm, but yeah but yeah you mentioned uh, nothing too modern I think that's because modern tracks will have a lot pushed into them and so the wave file is quite big whereas the older music if you look at it as a wave file it's quite dynamic and they don't often lead with an insanely punchy kick drum something that you would like add so those eras have a lot more space for us to add the kind of modern punchy dance floor elements and sometimes when you know in, the radio was kicking off and stereo was starting to become a thing people experimented a lot with panning so left and right so on an old record you might just hear the guitar on there so when we go in and sample, we can pull that out, double it up, remove the other side of the channel and just have a nice clean guitar. So when you are sampling, those era specific recording techniques allow us more room to maneuver and make it a bit more updated for our style. Mm. All right. And because one thing that kind of I, I was thinking of, and it's a line in Utility Man by Andy Cooper as well, but the beats bang and the music is timeless. Is, is there mm. a certain timeless sense uh, about the music of that era as well? Uh, I think so, for sure. Yeah, for us, it's totally timeless. And I guess we're just trying to put our own twist on it, really, and make it a little bit more accessible to people that it maybe it sounds a little bit too old to. So, yeah, putting our fatter drums behind it, a more modern bass or something, but not overdoing it, not overcooking it, and just trying to give the records the respect they deserve, really. Because if you just go chucking around huge bass drums and stuff, then it's just, it just doesn't feel like it's doing it justice, and it kind of takes away from the longevity of it i think if it's just you know over pushed overworked it just it's not something yeah. you can listen listen to all the time i don't think we would pepper our things with modern gimmicky type of things that would date it you know people move very quickly through electronic music and they're far more voracious in forming new styles than we are but in their wake they leave a lot of things that become cliched because they move so fast and people copy them but with our kind of stuff we're just treating these samples with respect they deserve and trying to keep it and what we do to honor that sound really rather than just kind of completely twist it up into the modern world to make it mad wobbly or whatever yeah because I, I suppose it's also where your your own musical heart lies right with with certain eras of music and certain uh, sounds and you want to convey that feeling that you felt uh when you listen to that music yourself uh, yeah i think a, when you oh, go ahead i was going to say that when you've got that sponge-like head when you're a teenager, that stuff you hear and love will be the stuff that kind of seeps into your DNA. And I don't think that's changed at all. So 
just trying to go back in really and understand why it spoke to us in such a way back in the day and just lift the hood up and look under it and try and make that kind of music ourselves. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, you know, these sort of records are the records that my dad was buying and I, I, adopt, I took on his record collection when he <laughs> didn't want it anymore and they're all sitting downstairs, you know. It's it, similar stuff that's being played to me and drummed into me as a kid, really. And, uh, yeah, it's just like part of my DNA now, I think. Is, can you share one sample that ended up on the promised land that you well, when you kind of discovered it, it was like, oh, this is this is gold. We, we've got something really good here because I, I suppose it's almost like a treasure hunt, right? Exactly. It's like a treasure hunt, but all the pieces of the jewels are all smashed up and you have to realize <laughs> where they fit in this crown or whatever. Yeah, we don't yeah. like to give too much away, but I think I think promised land, the track, um, there's two sort of main samples that just seem to fit together amazingly well, like mm. crazy well. <laughs> like they sound like they were made on, originally on the same record, I think. Right. Um, similar thing with God Walk Down, which was another gospel track of our first, very first album. It was just two yeah. samples that sounded like they should be together. Um, yeah, Promised lot- Land, big, chunky, grooving soul hook. Then a clean, modernish R&B a cappella, but then mixed in with black rock for the breakdown, and then adding our own kind of hand claps and stuff, as well as doing, as well as finding pinpoint lyrics to give you backing vocals or just say, "Come on, you're from another record." Things that you, if you lost, the track would lose a bit of groove. And then on top of that, besides our own drums and scratches. Andy Cooper, I think, plays a bit of synth. I think he might have been backing up with a bit of bass. We definitely asked him and his friend Cassie, who does some backing vocals on the album, to add a few oohs and ahs for the breakdown. So there's, there might be three or four samples, but then there's another, I don't know, 20, 30 layers of bits and pieces in there as well. Just a quick side question, because I... Um... Because you make, as you mentioned, very danceable music and kind of for the, for, for the um, dance floor. So yeah. when you were growing up, were you the guys that, are, that were on the dance floor going nuts or were you kind of in the corner trying to watch what, what was going on musically? Yeah, the latter. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be I'm... the one as a kid complaining the DJ wasn't playing Jizz's new single <laughs> while he's rocking the dance floor with pop music. Oh, God. I was like, uh, yeah, drum and bass raver in in my teenage years. I was sneaking up to London on the tube when I was 15 and going to these all-night raves at places like The End and Fabric and stuff. Um, So I was very much on the dance floor, but different music, really. (laughs) So it was early on that you kind of both realised, well, I want to do this. I want to manipulate music and make music and and, uh, go into this kind of uh, Mm. world. Yeah, just sit seeing other DJs really and sort of realizing that people can do that for a living and that's what you can, you know, you can dedicate your life to doing that sort of thing. It was a big yeah. realization. Definitely. Seeing all the early DMC style DJs, cash money, people like that through the eighties, nineties, and then hearing mixtapes by people like Andy Smith, DJ Yoda, um, Z trip, mm. uh, cold cut, of course. And then realizing you could, you know, do these journeys by DJs and tell stories through records and finding crazy records to, you know, outfox people with and these oddball curveball records that were amazing that no one knew about and just set us off on the hunt, really. So that's been a kind of uh, a consistent and hearing those early people, yeah, who, who put mixtapes out that still stand up today based on amazing selections and deft transitional DJ skills. Mm. Well, one last question about kind of the more general uh, side of what you do. Um, is, is there a, kind of a tendency to look for unknown music or for very rare uh, records and all that kind of stuff? Or, or is that just the way it, it happens to be? Yeah, I think there's probably two sides to it, really. There's there's one side being that you want to use something that people have, don't really know about just because that makes you more original, I guess. Um, and then the other side of it is those records that everyone does know are much more expensive to clear <laughs> normally. <laughs> yeah. the really, the really well-known, the champ break or something or whatever is, you know, that will cost, you won't, you won't make any money back from that. So it's a two double-ended sword, 
I suppose the other the flip side of it is that if you did sample something huge like the champ, then you'd probably have a hit, instant hit, because mm. <laughs> it's been a hit before. Which is a lot. It's basically what most of the fucking charts is these days is them just sampling, you know, hit records and re redoing them. Yeah, especially a, a couple of years ago, or maybe even five to ten years ago, they, they started making these electronic versions of Bruce Springsteen songs and that kind of stuff, and it just yeah. it, it topped the charts again. So it's it's very interesting how that goes. But again, that comes back then to the timeless you can nature of polish your turd. <laughs> Well, getting back to the album then, because I, uh, well, we mentioned Andy, but there's uh, Larry Sporners on the album, Marietta Smith, um, there's all kinds of people on the album. So uh, yeah, Andy Cooper, it's kind of, I, I get why you work with him, because yeah, you, you have a lot. How, what do you base your collaborations on? Do you do you kind of, when, for instance, a utility man, do you kind of immediately know, well, this is good for Andy? I yeah, mean, I yeah, that funny, funnily with that track, I I was always gunning for Andy on that track, and he, Andy wasn't keen on the idea at first because he thought it was too obvious. He, I think Andy often wants to go in a slightly more yeah. uh, off piece route with us and not be too obvious. But I just heard it. I was like, man, you're the right person for that record. That's a classic hip hop jam. That mm. sounds like Eric Eric B and Rakim or mm. you know, old old ugly duckling or something. That's that's mm. you. And I, gradually talked him around to it and he went yeah i suppose that is kind of what i do <laughs> all right i'll do it <laughs> i'm yeah. very glad it, very glad he did yeah i suppose he can turn that thing out in his sleep and he has mm -hmm. done not to say it's like sleepwalking but he's so good at it that when we give him a record like rock rock which is insanely fast and more of a lyrical challenge and he's he'll labor over it crazy and giving him like a classic boom bap beat he might be like come on Let's try something a bit, guess up it, up it a gear, but we want to hear that classic boom that beat. So <laughs> you have to give the people what they want a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bruce Springsteen techno remixes. <laughs> um, well, the, what I find interesting then is do you keep your eye on uh, up and coming talent in terms of uh, rappers, hip uh, kind of musicians? Do, do you keep an eye on that or, or are you kind of in your own uh, world? Which probably don't do enough if we're honest i think we're in our own little world and probably looking backwards a lot of the time um certainly if something if we hear hear a record and it pricks our ear then we'll mm. we'll be making a note of that rapper or whoever and trying to approach them for sure but um but yeah i guess we're trying to bring back what we love about the decades and eras of music that we were really into so we're trying to find people that are still maybe part of that or were were a big part of that back in the day. Yeah. There's a few people on the radar like Confucius MC and Strategy and people coming out of Manchester, super dope, that were yet to kind of reach out to in any formidable way and say, yo, work on this beat, straight fire, blood. But there are people out there that could be up for consideration and just having a good conversation between ourselves to think about what's a good direction for some of these next set of beats and next set of beats. Because... Um, Getting big people on is amazing, but it costs a fortune and often they don't give you the best work. So find it. Hungry people as well and people that are going to put the time in and want to help make a stamp for themselves and an identity and we can help each other, bring each other up a bit more. That might be an exciting next Yeah, step. people that are willing to put the work in and are hungry for it is, is a really important and, you know, and are nice people to work with because you can end up having to work with them quite a lot on a record in reality. So, yeah. You can tell quite quickly who those people are. And that's why we've ended up going back to a lot of people. We've gone back to Dynamite, we've gone back to Addy Cooper, Skunkadelic, Syntax, all those guys, because they're just they're just lovely to work with and you know you're gonna get something good. Yeah. The dream is to build that little little family of people you can go back to and just all develop new songs on each album so people can see how they've all progressed and how those tunes all build in with each other in the in the larger back catalogue when it all when all the dust settles and we're older, older men. Well, I don't know if this is a good question, but do you lament the fact that the the, the type of music or the type of hip hop that, that you grew up on and, and are interested in isn't really represented much in, in the mainstream in a way? Nah. Hip hop's <laughs> got to move on, hasn't it? It's a shark. I mean, if, if the stuff that we loved or the stuff you people, gatekeepers, consider to be the authentic version, if it was the only version anyone heard, 
And then no upstarts would come out of the water and you know, offend everyone and make brand new music. So more power to anyone who wants to do anything they want to. But we got a kind of sound that we kind of know how to make. So we don't try and do stuff we don't want to know to seem, seem faddish. But fair play to anyone doing anything. Yeah, fair enough. Um, final question then. Say the word. Uh, when I talked to you about say the word, you weren't able to do any shows or anything. Um, so now that I, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but here things are, are opening up a little bit. And I, I believe there are still, uh, already festivals going on in the UK and that kind of stuff. So being able to play again, well, what kind of with what kind of energy do you enter kind of the, the next couple of months? Yeah, well, our summer, the first half was kind of shut down. No events were allowed to take place. And then all restrictions were lifted completely. Um, and it was just like, and all the festivals from the beginning of the summer had been postponed back to the end of the summer. Plus we had the ones scheduled in anyway. So we had a very busy second half of the summer. And what was interesting was, I think before the Say The Word album, which was the last time we really did any gigs, we weren't really doing like main stage stuff, you know, <laughs> at the festivals. We were in the, the side tents or something. But we released the Say The Word album. We obviously went up a gear in everyone's eyes, in the promoter's eyes and all the rest of it. And then when we came back after the pan, well, not that it's over, but, you know, when restrictions were lifted, suddenly we were like, okay, we're playing main stage everywhere. <laughs> okay. And it was the first few were just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> pretty scary but um yeah it, it was explosive and it was great to be doing really good shows like every show was really good you know whereas normally that would be like one in one in five would be really good <laughs> but this they were they were all like really good so yeah it's it's been it's been good it's been good how, how come how come these uh, shows well was it kind of the eagerness of everybody wanting to be uh, on stage again and the, uh, the audience as well wanting to experience live music again i for sure there's definitely definitely felt that energy from people yeah a certain up for itness about it but i what i mean is i think that we went during the pandemic we actually went up in popularity mm. as well so we were given better slots on those stages you know we were, we were playing the headline slots or whatever um so we had a better audience in front of us bigger a bigger crowd um yeah both those things i guess yeah well one last thing then why do you think that is why do you think people uh especially with the last two records then ff kind of latched on to you so it's maybe difficult to say about your own music but why do you think people have latched on to to say the word and now the promised land well, the cold, hard facts of it is I think we've got to listen to a little bit more because we managed to get on some playlists and things like that. So that gets people who might not normally in your orbit get uh, set their set of ears on you. So we had tracks like Felony that got A-listed on Six Music in the UK, which is massive for us, massive for anyone really. So that means, you know, have a, however, however many times a day people who are just doing the ironing or whatever, or quietly day drinking, are hearing our song. So that kind of keeps ticking in so yeah i think i think as well uh because of the lockdowns people were at home listening to music more than they would normally mm -hmm. searching through spotify had extra time on their hands to discover new music and consume music you know who gets to listen to music if they've got an office job they're probably sat there not listening <laughs> to music um whereas if you're at home uh not working on furlough Mm. you're gonna have tunes on aren't you so i think there's definitely a bit of that as well with the with the say the word album and that mm. that definitely helped well let's hope uh, the promised land kind of keeps you guys up in, in uh, going in that upward uh, trajectory uh, gentlemen so. thank you so much for taking time to talk with me thanks man good to see thank you, you again time. yes you too